You good to go? Awesome. Well, we are so excited that you are here with us. Uh, welcome everybody back to Camp Carmen. We are in week three of Voices of Carmen rehearsal, production. We've got our cast, we've got our crew. It's been a busy three weeks, um, but we are excited to have our workshop Wednesdays. And that's where we bring in friends who have been doing this a little longer than us, who have some stories to tell, who have some journeys they've been on that they want to share with us. Uh, mentorship is a huge part of this program, Voices of Carmen, um, as we create musical theater and sort of workshop form with everybody contributing their creative um, talents and abilities and ideas to building a new show. And we do this every year, but every year it's different. Every year it's new based on the folks who have come and join us um, in the space as a part of the cast and the crew. Um, we've had three or four Carmen coaching series um, so far, Lauren, do you have a slide for that? But now we are excited to welcome uh, Andre McCray and Donna Bovino. Can we give it up for them? And the topic uh, for today is personal journeys, career transitions, and new chapters. We have had coaching series on just sort of our body as an instrument and our voice and our wholeness and wellness. We have had them on studio recordings, um, how to show up in a studio, how to do voiceovers and what the language is and what people are asking you when you're an actor working in a studio session. Uh, we had our Broadway edition with uh, Wendy Cavett and Marion Caffey and did some mock auditions. And now we're just going to have a really candid conversation with two of my favorite people People who are super easy to talk to and have so much to share and so much of their own personal history. So again, a round of applause for Andre and Donna, and let's welcome them to Camp Carmen and our panel. And so the way we are going to start out, um, that we love to start out, is we are going to have uh, one of our uh, cast members introduce themselves and um, start with an opening question. So Alana, why don't you introduce yourself and then check in with Donna and, and have a little conversation to open up and find out a little bit more about her. Um, hello, my name is Alana Williamson. I'm a cast member here at Voices of Carmen. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, okay, so I'll ask an origin story question. Um, so when you were uh, 17 or um, just getting ready to pursue musical theater in like a, a teenager type setting, uh, what were you doing? What were you up to? Well, we have to go back before 17 because I actually, my career was a little unorthodox in the sense that I, I grew up outside of New York City and I made my Broadway debut when I was eight years old. So I was on Broadway when I was eight and I, before that I was doing a lot of film and television, so I was a child actor. And then when I was around 12 and 13, a lot of things in my life changed. My, my, I wanted to, I, I felt like I wanted to be with my friends more. I felt like I didn't have as many friends as some of my, you know, going into middle school. Um, there wasn't as much work for someone 12, 13 years old. I was going through changes in my body and I needed braces or whatever. I don't know. Like I just, and I wasn't feeling it. And then my parents were also splitting up. So I was, my mom, I have brothers. So she was a single mom with three kids, was not about to start running me an audition. So my whole life kind of changed. And I then um, started getting involved at my, my school. I went to a public high school in New Jersey and I did all the musicals and all the plays there. I worked really hard. I feel like that's where I got some of my best training, believe it or not, because yes, I had the experience as a child actor, but to work with my peers, the school that I went to in New Jersey actually has a really great public uh, school musical theater program. So it had just started when I got there. So I was very lucky. And then um, I was too nervous to go into show business, even though I had done it professionally as a small child. When I was 17, I decided uh, I don't want to go to school for it because I was nervous I couldn't make it. I had doubts about myself, to be honest. We all do sometimes, right? So I thought I have to get a secure career, whatever that means. And uh, so I went to Barnard College in New York City um, and thought I was going to become a lawyer. But plans changed and I I couldn't help but follow my passion and you know when I was 21 I'm like I can't go to law school <laughs> so that was sort of my journey I like 
was a, I was very successful as a child in show business, left as a teenager, and then found my way back toward the end of my college career. So, Awesome. Thank you so much, Donna. Alana, if you can stay with us. I love just hearing about sort of what was life like before you ever sort of had the big resume and all the things that you do. But now we're actually going to hear your big resume. And uh, Alana, if you can read uh, her bio for us so we know a little bit more about what she's done since she was eight um, <laughs> up to this point. Donna Vivino is an American actress and singer, most recently seen in the 2019-2020 Broadway revival national tour of Cats as Grizabella, which closed due to the COVID-19 crisis. Tears. Um, she was nominated for an SF Bay Area Theater Critics Award for Best Actress in Play for Finks in 2019, and nominated for a 2018 Los Angeles Ovation Award uh, the, for Best Actress in a musical for her portrayal of Mary Flynn and Merrily We Go Along. Ooh, nice musical. Directed by Michael Arden and opposite Wayne Brady. She performed as Elphaba in Wicked on Broadway, uh, and previously seen starring in the role on the first national tour. Very cool. Um, Donna has been on Broadway since she was since the age of eight. Uh, she was the original young set in Les Mis on Broadway and uh, on the cast recording. She starred on Broadway in Fame Becomes Me with Martin Short and was also on Broadway in Hairspray in Saturday, in Saturday Night Fever. Fever. Mm. Favorite roles include Diana Goodman in Next to Normal. Mm, yes. <laughs> at Bristol Riverside Theater and um, Serena Maxwell in the web series Submissions Only. Donna is also the founder of the youth arts program, Broadway Unlimited. Very impressive. Snaps. Thanks, <laughs> Donna. Thank you so much, Donna and Alana. Oops, that rhymes a little bit. Um, <laughs> so now we're going to switch up and bring Seth and Andre out to just, uh, Seth's going to introduce himself um, and sort of get a sense of what Andre was up to when he was around Seth's age. <clears throat> Hello, everybody watching. My name is Seth Clemens, and I am 15 years old. Um, uh, so my first question for you is, when you were my age, what were you interested in, and what were you up to? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say to everyone, it is so good to be here, and I, I cannot tell you how inspired that I am by you guys, and... I mean, when I was your age, I was not doing, I mean, I was checking out your live stream. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, just the level of talent and drive and inspiration. I just can't, I'm jealous. I wish, ah, anyway. So when I was your age um, in 1855, uh, <laughs> you know, a long time ago, <laughs> Lord. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was obsessed. Like I was just sort of finding myself as an artist and I fell in love actually with opera. Like we had a really amazing musical theater program in my high school. So I was doing all that stuff, but I actually started falling in love with opera. I, I went to the library and I'm from Philly and I was uh, in Elkins Park, Northern Philly in the suburbs. And I went to the library one summer and I saw a, this on an LP which is a record, you probably don't even know what that is. So on, on a record, I saw a, the face of Leontine Price, African-American soprano. And I didn't know black people sang opera, you know? So I, I was like, oh, okay, well, let me take this home and I listened to it and I became obsessed. It was called Umbalo y Mascara. It's an Italian opera. And I was so obsessed with it that I would like listen to the operas until like the wee hours of the morning. And my mom would be mad at me because the light, I would be keeping the lights on. And she was like, I'm gonna turn the lights out because of, you know, the electric bill. And so I would turn the lights out and I would read the libretto, you know, with my flashlight, uh, you know, listening, you know, reading the English, the translation, because I was obsessed. And as I look back at it now, I realized that I was obsessed with excellence. That's really what I was obsessed with because that's really what she represented, art and excellence. And for me, what I can see in my story is just my desire for art, excellence and impact. And so that started for me when I was your age, I just started obsessing and I started dreaming. And that's when I decided uh, to go to school for music. So um, I went to Temple University for two years and then transferred to CCM, Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music 
and got a couple degrees from there. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Seth, will you uh, do us the honor of reading Andre's bio? Yes, I will. <clears throat> Andre McRae, I hope I'm saying his name right, has been a featured soloist with the National Symphony Orchestra, Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, Indianapolis, and Baltimore Symphony Orchestras. After touring Europe and Japan in Porgy and Best, Andre won first prize in the American Tr Traditions Competition in the Savannah Musical Festival. Andre is currently a composer at the BMI Lehman Engel Musical Theater Workshop. He is developing a new musical, Chasing the Wind. Awesome. All right, Lauren, thank you, Andre. Thank you, Seth. Um, let's see a little clip of um, some of Andre's work and then we'll, uh, we'll actually go back to Donna. We'll see a little clip of Donna, to sort of see Donna in action. And then Andre, you can set us up for the clip that you have for us as well. Watch actress Donna Vivino as she's transformed into the Wicked Witch of the West in the musical Wicked at the Orpheum Theater in Minneapolis. She's actually pretty, but people just don't like her because of the skin. No one really looks bad in green. No. We usually do it in about 20 to 25 minutes on a normal night. Watch actress. Um, we have done it in seven. Um, the audience forgets at some point that they're that they're green. It's so light and it and it's and. When I'm out there on stage, I start to forget as well, just like Alpha Blue. You know, I wish I could be green all the time. Well, not really, but kind of. <laughs> so. Pretty much everybody looks good in green, which you would never think. You know, everybody that we put it on, they actually look really good in it. You know, she's an activist. That's that's sort of what I. One of the things I love about playing Alpha Buzz is that she just never apologizes for what she believes in. I learn things about her every day. <laughs> So. When I'm out there on stage, I start to forget as well, just like Alpha Blue would, you know, and, and other people's reactions, and then you're like, oh, right, I'm different. <laughs> Get her hair flat as possible, the wig cap on, but just maybe a last check on my voice, and, you know, maybe a little, like, silent prayer to myself that do my best. <laughs> now I'm ready for my close-up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So we have a ton of questions for you, but I love to open up first. Now that you've heard a little bit about Donna and you've heard a little bit about Andre for um, our cast and crew to just jump in with any questions that you wanna know, right? Even as you heard their stories or their journeys, what are some things that came to mind that you'd be interested? And if Perry and Lauren can keep an eye on the chat, that'd be great, cause I get in there and I'm like, girl, I don't know what you ask and I can't see, so. <laughs> Uh, yes, Tenuria, you have your hand up. Um, this question is for Donna. Um, so how long was the audition process for the Broadway shows? Oh, that's a really, really great question. I'm going to tell you very quickly how um, that my audition for Wicked was one day, which is highly unusual. I happened to go in on one day where they threw, they said, oh yeah, come in today. And I walked in the room and the entire room was, it was a final call. Somehow they threw me in on that. I had never been in for Wicked. It was sort of a, I don't know how it was just meant to be. And then I got it, which is everyone else there. They had been through all the other auditions. Hairspray, which I did with Miss CJ. <laughs> 14 times I auditioned for that show. I started out going to open calls. This was right out of college when I was like, I'm going to start over. And everyone's coming out of the conservatories. I was so behind. I had no dance training. I was out of shape. I just knew I wanted to be in that show. I saw it and I'm like, I want to be in that show. 
I wanted to be Tracy Turnblad or anything. And I wound up being in the ensemble and was so excited. Like, I just wanted to do anything in that show. And I went to the open call cut. And I just kept going and going. And I finally got the first national tour with where I met CJ uh, 14 times. I wouldn't give up. I think they just hired me because they're like, okay, she's back. Like, we better just put her in the show. <laughs> What happened was with that, my vocals were always great. I couldn't pick up the choreography, but I would keep going to the open dance calls and learn it and then go try to practice. Now you can go on YouTube and look at stuff and kind of have it nice, but I really struggled with my dancing. And so I kept, even when we were rehearsing for that show, I would, I had, a, I, I would, um, I was behind everybody else. I could just tell I wasn't picking it up like everyone else. So I, would go back to I went to a rehearsal studio and asked someone in the show I'm like I will pay you they're like you don't have to pay me I'm like can you please give me extra rehearsal and teach me and I and I did it for a couple days and it really caught me up because I was I was um I was behind if I could you know I so 14 times for that one and and also it's just timing look at Wicked it, you know I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and the right day and casting said let's just bring her in and see what they think so you you never know uh every show is going to be different um, I'd say that the only difference with Broadway shows and with auditioning for anything, including something at your school or uh, something in community theater, is that Broadway tends to have more money. That's it. But an audition is an audition. That's what I always say. It's just another opportunity to do something you love and show what you do and try to enjoy it. That's how, that's how I, I see it. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Jared and then Elowen. Um, This is a question for either of you. Either of you can answer. Um, so I was going to ask, because like as artists, you, you, you want to build your craft and you kind of see that as your like your source of success. Like I'm getting better in this craft and I'm working at it. So my question for either of you is um, how do you define success for yourself when your career seems to not be skyrocketing or like, you know, getting bigger, like, oh, you know, the big stuff. So how do you define success for yourself when that's not happening? Uh, I can, I can share. Um, I, I think for me, it goes back. Oh, by the way, Donna, I can relate to the audition for Hairspray and the dancing. I'm a great singer, but not a great dancer. Oh, I got stories. <laughs> I'm going And that, that particular choreo for Hairspray, I mean, everyone is like doing the pony over here. <laughs> doing the pony. Way out somewhere else. I mean, I can't. Oh, I feel you. I feel you with that. Um, for for me, it's it goes back to art, excellence, and impact. You know, I I learned I learned what I call the ten thousand dollar lesson. So CCM, the opera department, has like uh, a competition where all the grad students and post-grad students compete against each other for three pri prizes, $10,000, 7,500 and 5,000, it's probably more now. And so I wanted that $10,000 prize because if I got the $10,000 prize, then that was gonna tell me that I was an artist and I was among the best. And so I went to my teacher and I'm working hard and he's like, Andre, you just wanna sing well. You just wanna sing well. And I'm like, no, no, I'm gonna get the $10,000 prize. I competed, I, I got the $5,000 prize. I was disappointed. Years later, after working on my craft, but also working on myself, my heart, you have to do the work and work on you. And that's what I, honestly, what I hear in Donna's story is just, you know, it sounds like she worked on her, working through those insecurities and all the different things. You know, I love that. And so you have to work on you. And so after working on me, there was another competition uh, at the Savannah Music Festival, the American Traditions Competition, it had a $10,000 prize. But this time, my approach was different. I just wanted to sing well. I just wanted to give my heart. I just wanted, I cared about art and excellence and impact. That was my primary goal. My primary goal wasn't the $10,000 prize. I won the $10,000 prize. I won that competition. You know, so it just, it, it was a great example to me of, you have to care about the deeper things, fame, money, that kind of success. That's not the deeper thing. Those are good things, but you want to care about the deeper things. And for me, it's art, excellence, and impact. Amazing. Amazing. Um, did I say Elowen after? 
And then uh, Donna and Andre, if you have 2020 vision and want to look in the chat. I was going to uh, ask, I see a lot of things. Should we write in there or are we going to ask them out loud for everyone to hear? Um, How would you like to do the chat? We'll, we'll ask them out loud. Okay, I didn't answer them. I'm looking at them going, I'm not going to answer these, yeah. but yeah. I do have so answers. Let's, okay. let's go with Elowin and then we'll go to the chat with some of these questions. And Lauren and Perry, if y'all can help with that. Um, so this is this is a question for Donna, and it's about being on Broadway. So what was your experience like being basically just like on Broadway? What, what, like what was your did you think that did you did you consider that making it like did you think that you made it or do you want to continue like going higher or um, yeah, just like what was your thoughts while being on Broadway? I guess what was your so experience? it happened to me as a child. So I. I didn't understand really what that was. And I think that's what intimidated me when I was older because I thought, well, I've already done what everyone, everybody says that Broadway is the top, which by the way is not true. Broadway is, is, is a lot of money. It's very commercial. Mm -hmm. So you can get paid, paid more. It's, it's really about the money. I'm just going to say it. And it's New York, which is a fabulous city. But it's really a 10 block radius of theaters with very high price tickets. And yes, it is competitive to get into a Broadway show. But um, there's theater all over the place. Um, you know, something that I had actually tweeted out, I've never had a viral tweet in my life until earlier this year. And I wrote something and it wasn't me trying to, I just spoke from my heart and I said, I love Broadway. Broadway's been good to me, but my goodness, everyone, there is more to life than Broadway. It was when everything was saying, let's get Broadway back. I said, we need to be you know, supporting the college theaters and the community theaters and the youth theaters right now that are closed and the regional theaters, because I have to tell you that I, I listen, I, I'd be a liar if I said I didn't love working on Broadway. But when I work regionally, I love it the most because y you are really part of a community. And the, the relationship between an audience and everybody in the show is very different. I love working in um in the Philadelphia area for that reason. I just, I, I where you're from, Andre, I, I worked at Bristol Riverside and I've worked at Philadelphia Theater Company and I, I, I just always feel like I'm part of a community when I'm there and I think it's pretty special. Um, Broadway is, is uh, you said something about going higher. I think I always just sort of, what Andre said, I always try to just challenge myself. You know, I, I wanted to play Diana Goodman wherever it was. It was in Bristol, uh, Pennsylvania and there there I went so for me it, it's more about the roles I do like that there's a little more money on Broadway I'd be a liar if I didn't say that but I actually do a lot of concert work too that pays quite well and it's not eight shows a week uh, singing something like Elphabus so um, there are other ways to make money too if that's something that you know Broadway is it's wonderful but it is it is not a measure of success as an artist promise you that and I just want you guys to know that all of you thank you for that truth uh, Donna uh, let's go to the chat Perry or Lauren sure can you guys hear me yes all right great um, our first question is from Kobe and it's for Donna uh, and he asked what did it feel like playing uh, a role as iconic as Elphaba um it was a dream role come true. I had no, I never thought I would get that part. They did not physically see me as that type. I'm short, I'm round, and I have curly hair. So they thought, well, you have to be Glinda, but you're not really a soprano like that. I am, but I don't really get hired to do that. And I was funny. I had been doing hairspray and whatnot, and I wasn't tall and skinny and what they saw as that part. So because of that, and I heard, I said, well, I want to go in for Alphaba, and then I got a phone call. Well, you have an audition for Alphaba, but they said they're, they're going to let you come in because you've been working with Martin Short. So they thought I was fancy for a minute. So they're going to bring you in, but but uh, don't expect anything. It's fine. And that's what made me have the best audition of my life. I was just like, I cannot, I did not, I was like, there's no way I'm going to get this part. So, which is kind of a weird thing to think, but I just went in going, I'm so excited to sing this music. I've been wanting someone to just hear me sing this part because I've been singing it in my living room over and over. And I went in and I had no pressure because I really thought, that, and, and Stephen Schwartz is there. I'm like, I get to sing this for Stephen Schwartz. And that was it. And I went in, one thing I did do is I, I straightened my hair. I wore no makeup and I just wore black jeans and a black tank top. I just sort of was like, all right, I'm going to go in with zero glam 
so that they don't even think, well, maybe she's kind of like a Glinda. And uh, and there and there I was with the part. So that was that to me was the victory. Then you do that part, and let me tell you, I it was a dream role, but it is something that should not be sung eight times a week. It they still don't have the matinee alphabet. It was terrifying. I learned so much about my voice. I I was I. I was training even from on the road, over the phone, over Skype, which is something you probably don't even know what that is with my vocal teacher. I didn't speak outside of the show. I really think I became a voice teacher because I played Alphaba and learning about vocal health. I studied classically while I played that role. If I couldn't sing Glinda, I would not go on for Alphaba. That's what I always used to tell myself. So it was a dream come true, but it was a master class in my voice. So. I see a question. Thank you so much, Donna. Such good stuff. I hope y'all are taking notes. It's fantastic. Um, Andre, uh, since you sing opera, and at times I do too for my art department, and this is a question from Willie at my school, how many languages did you have to study in order to sing any piece of music to perfection? Yeah. So first of all, I, I want to say, you know, Donna makes a really great point that, you know, the, the the classical training is so important you know it, it's 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 important as a dancer uh even though i was never a great dancer but i definitely took you know ballet just so that i could have that line so i could look like i was better than i was and and it's the same vocally that classic training if you're going to be a pop singer if you're going to be a musical theater singer or jazz singer the classical training it's going to help you with all of it it's going to keep you in line it's going to help you know what you're doing it's going to help you to to keep your voice that that longevity, you know, the endurance, uh, it helps all of that, you know. So I love that, Donna. Um, uh, you know, so for for me, yeah, I had to study a in most conservatories, you have to study a year of Italian, a year of French, and a year of German. I was an Italian minor when I was at Temple because I love the language because it's so beautiful. Um, you know, so you don't you don't have to, I mean, they encourage you, if you're gonna be an opera singer, they actually encourage you to be able to speak it fluently, but really you just have to be able to, that year is to help you to understand basic grammar so that when you have a song that you're singing or an opera that you're singing, when you're translating it, you, you at least have an idea of um, the grammar so that when you translate it, you know what you're talking about. You also have to have a, at least I had a semester of um, Italian diction, German diction and French diction. You know, so a lot of times, honestly, when I went to Europe, I sounded better than I really was. Like, I had no idea what I was talking about. You know, I wasn't able to really communicate with the people, but I could sound fantastic. They thought, oh, my God, this guy speaks Italian. And then they start talking to me and I don't know what they're talking about. You know, so I was totally exposed, you know, but, you know, you can sound really, really good. So. Awesome. So we could be here with questions all day. And I really appreciate that y'all have your hands up and are so enthusiastic uh, for our guests. But I would love to get an opportunity for Andre to set up some of his work and, and be able to take a look or a listen um, to something from Andre today um, to sort of better inform us of what he does as a composer and um, how he works in musical theater. Okay, so can I... CJ, I want to start with one of the composer demos. Is that okay? You think that's a good idea? Sure. Okay. As opposed to the Kennedy Center one? Sure. Okay. So, guys, I'm writing a show called Chasing the Wind. And um, <clears throat> it is, I've been working on it for a minute here. Uh, I uh, would like to share with you guys a song called Stars and Other Skies. And uh, I started writing maybe about, uh, 10 or so years ago, sort of informally, and have been really working on this show for the past, like, probably five, maybe five or so years that I've been working really consistently and hard on the show. <clears throat> uh, the song is called Stars in Other Skies. Uh, the show is about King Solomon. Actually, I'll read you the, the little blurb that I have. Chasing the Wind is an allegory of the American experience or of any experience of extreme privilege. It asks the question, what does it mean to be alive when you have it all? The story is not really about Solomon at all. It's about privilege uh, and it's says Solomon in the Bible. 
with sub-themes of addiction, destiny, and meaning of life and purpose. JFK, Marilyn Monroe, Jeff Bezos, they are extreme examples of stories that represent what America is just as much as the Statue of Liberty symbolizes it. We are privileged and broken. Some would say we're not broken, but we're unfinished. Okay. And this is Solomon's story, privileged and broken. And this is, in my view, also the American story. Um, so the thing that you're about to see is Solomon, uh, he is, sorry, things keep turn, turning around here. Solomon is an introspective young man. He's coming to the harsh reality that his father, the great David is dying. The great King David is dying. He is alone and outside on the balcony contemplating what all of this means. He's struck by the lack of, of the lack of his capacity to feel. Abby is a concubine brought to the palace to tend to the ailing King David. She's extremely beautiful, bright, full of wit and wisdom. She represents purity and goodness in Solomon's life, something he will turn away from later in his story. Finds him on the balcony. What you're going to hear, guys, is a demo of me as the composer singing the different parts. And the reason why I wanted to share, share this with you is because uh, I have the privilege of being in BMI Lehman Angle Musical Theater writing workshop. It's a prestigious workshop for emerging musical theater writers. People like, honestly, the writers of Next to Normal, Donna's show, came from BMI. Uh, Alan Menken came from BMI. The writers of Frozen came from BMI. And all these guys, when they're writing their musicals, when they're just getting started, the composers make their own little, like, scratched tracks or like, you know, podunk little demos just to send to the actors, ascend to people and to even put for competitions and grants. They just use their own voices. And, and the people that are listening have to be able to get an idea of what they're trying to do. You know, so I wanted to share this with you guys and uh, you can tell me what you think. Stars and other skies. Solomon, my lord. Hi. Hi. What are you doing out here? I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's secluded and calm. And the sky, it's almost as beautiful as the sky above my village back home. Your village is in Israel. It's the same sky. No. There's nothing like the night sky of the village of Sulam. My home. When I was a little girl, I would lay in the grass at night and gaze at the stars. They were so vivid, it looked like you could touch them. So I would spend hours trying to count them. I did. I would fall asleep and then when I awoke in the middle of the night, I realized I'd lost count. And I had to start all over again. Mother would ask me, why do you waste time counting the lesser stars? You are the brightest star. Mother is no longer with us. I'm sorry. It's okay. She's why I'm here. How's that? Because she believed. No matter how bad things got, no matter how grim it looked, she believed. And that's her story. Mother said be good, mother said be smart, hide your feelings, be self-assured. Mother said be strong, but kind. Mother said I could, mother said I would be more than she could be. She said I had a good mind, but it would take time to find where I meant to be. She would look into my eyes and tell me There are stars in other skies She sounds lovely, but that doesn't exactly answer the question how you got here. I'm not done, be patient, my lord. There were a thousand girls with a thousand stories All of them were beautiful, but only one could make it to the king rigors of being chosen the king's concubine. Well, mother said I should try, and I said, why? I'm more than happy here at home. When really, it was fear. She said, to find who you're meant to be, you have to rise, and then you 
will see the stars in other skies. Open the door and explore all the things you've tucked away. Deep within your heart, there's so much more in store. at a time take it one day at a time one moment at a time even <laughs> your mother was trying to get you here my mother was trying to keep me here well, it looks like you're needed here I need to get out of this place where would you go? far from here I've spent a lot of time in books searching for something I don't know my purpose perhaps I've spent a lot of time in my head. I've written countless useless, pithy insights. Now the future of the king, my father, is uncertain and I have no insights. I have no feelings. I don't feel anything. Everyone has feelings, my lord. But sometimes when we are afraid, we lose our connection. Mother would say that is when it is most important to believe. So I answered the call, I entered the game, she gave them my name. It was brutal, from a thousand down to ten, and then three, now just me. But all in all, I can still hear her voice, she gave me a choice. Stay or leave, she said, be wise in your choosing. So I chose to believe. Solomon, you have everything you need. All you have to do is believe. You are the brightest star. And your mother, she's among the stars in other skies. That was my first kiss. Mine too. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, there is so much love in the chat. Thanks for listening to that, guys. That's You're the, actually the first people that have heard that outside of my friends. We oh have, my gosh, it's amazing. Trap, so wow. thank you. Thanks yeah. for listening. Can we take a moment just to get some reactions? Donna, feel free to share yours. And then Perry, if you can just read down some of the things that people were experiencing in the chat. We always talk about feedback in the moment. What did it feel like? Where did it take you? And all of that kind of stuff. Um, my, my, I'm teared up <laughs> because uh, it's, uh, it was just, it just kind of washed over you in this beautiful way. So I had a visceral reaction. And then my music logic brain is like, ooh, that was a nice chord to go to. <laughs> So it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I I want more. I want and it, and it was great storytelling. I just think it was lovely. So that's it. I'm gonna I'm gonna let everybody else talk because there's a lot of talking going on in this chat. So <laughs> okay, let's hear it. Yeah, um, Ella said the theme of purpose and how each character feels about it is really well reflected. Um, I need this song so I can add it to my playlist. Um, we're excited that we got to hear it so early on in the process. Um, we liked it. We loved it. It was beautiful. Um, we're rooting for Abby and Solomon. Um, <laughs> um, chills. And we'll definitely save this chat. Somebody said, when did you realize this was your calling? I, I would like to know how you started writing. Can I ask? Can I ask that? I'm so curious about that. Sorry. It's not. Conversation. Let's let it go. <laughs> hey, Donna, can I ask you, can you turn your mic down just a little bit, your gain? Mm -hmm. When are the auditions? <laughs> Is that yeah, better? That's, oh, yes. 
so Thank much you. better. Yeah. So yeah, can you talk about that aspect of your journey, um, Andre, writing and, and becoming a composer? Yeah. So when I left, uh, I, I did uh, regional theater for about four years. And what Donna is saying about regional theater is just so true. It just is so true. So I did, I traveled for about four years doing regional theater and I was sort of dabbling with writing. And then I joined the military just so I could pay off my student loans, to be honest with you. And then I was going to go back to theater, but then I decided to stay because I, I bought a house. I had my family over my house and I was freaking out because I'm like, oh my gosh, have I settled? Is it over? You know, I have a house now. Uh, you know, am I like suburban and like normal? And so I really was sort of freaking out. And my I played a song that I had written and uh, that I didn't think it was that big of a deal for my family, for my mom and my grandmother. And, and I was lost, I didn't know what to do. And my mom and my grandmother said, Andre, this is what you should be doing. And so I said, okay. And so I started writing from there and I uh, just started to grow. Then a friend of mine told me about BMI uh, and if any of you are musical theater writers, please look into BMI. And so I, I auditioned not thinking that I would get in, and I did. And uh, so it just went from there. Got an agent from there. So it just has been great. Andre, can you talk more about sort of what your job is in the Army and, and how you're able to you know, have this particular career, but also simultaneously be creating content and work that you want to do because artists often are doing both of those things, right? To pay the bills and also be creative with your own ambition and dreams. Right. So I will say this to artists, but I don't say this if I'm going to be sort of doing PR for my job, but I can say it to you guys. This job is like my serving job. So when I was in New York auditioning, doing that hairspray audition, doing the... <laughs> working a pony when I was doing that like I was serving and honestly what's funny about that audition was like we I went from I was working at Stardust as a server um and I ran from Stardust to you know Ripley to do that audition in and that's my, a restaurant for anyone who doesn't know like a, like a diner it's a diner it's a singing diner so um you know so you work as you know you work to pay the bills. And so a lot of actors are, you know, servers as they're doing the auditions. And so that's what I was doing. And so now uh, this job has basically become for me like my serving job, meaning um, it, it's the job that pays my bills so I can do really what I want to do. And I feel so insanely blessed to have that because it, the job allows a lot of flexibility. Uh, I'm in the Army Chorus, which is one of the components of the Army Band. It's the premier band in the military. And, um, you know, the chorus is about uh, 24 guys. And uh, right now we're adding women soon, it looks like. But, uh, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a great gig. You know, we sing at the White House. We sing at the Capitol. It's a prestigious, you know, thing. But it also, because we sing a lot of the same things, it also allows us a lot of time and flexibility. And so uh, not only am I able to pay my bills and eat <laughs> and, you know, and have a house, I actually have two houses, you know, I'm able, I've been able to, uh, you know, write and, and they have actually encouraged this aspect of me. They're actually encouraging me to do it, you know, which has really been great, you know, so it's been the best, the best serving job in the country. If you have <laughs> All right. So uh, let's go to some more questions. Um, let me look around and then we'll go back to sort of our list of actual questions. Uh, and, and next up on our list of questions, just thinking about who has uh, in your careers has influenced you, uh, whether it be, um, sort of influencing you the most or influencing you when you were, you know, shifting gears or changing direction? You want me to answer while you're thinking? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would, okay, this is going to be a weird answer. There are two if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, there are two things that have influenced me Two, One is my grandmother and the other is acid reflux. Mm. Okay. So again, if I, if I'm understanding the question, if I remember the question. Yes. Yeah, so and it's like what experiences or people have influenced you. So this is perfect. Right. So 
Okay, so my grandmother um, is an artist and she has helped me. I always say that my grandmother is like my Yoda, except much taller and much more attractive. <laughs> she is so full of wisdom and she has helped me to um, be who I am. You know, she has helped me to, she has, you know, okay, an example of her, she would say things to me like, Andre, don't let people rent space in your head. Um, she said to me once, she was 85 years old, and, and she said to me once we were in the car, drive, I was driving her home, she's 85, I'm 50 years her junior. And she says, Andre, um, what, what do you think I can work on? She's 85, <laughs> asking me, what can I work on? You know, and I told her a couple things and and she took that in and, and tried to work on those things. So it just taught me that I need to stay open, you know, and and so I, I, I'm just so grateful to her that she has helped me also to, to be able to be myself in a world full of carbon copies, be proud to be an original, mm. she would in a world full of carbon copies, be proud to be an original, you know, um, that I need to be who I am. You know, so my grandmother, and then the second thing, acid reflux, acid reflux. Terrible, when I was at Temple University, you know, four score and a thousand years ago, uh, I, I had the flux and they didn't know what they know now about the flux. You know, and if you don't know about it, I'm sure many of you singers do, you know, you eat certain foods, it gets on the cords, makes the cords thick, you know, it changes, you know, you, you, it's hard for longevity with your singing and endurance, it, you know, it cut off some of your high notes. So I was obsessed with opera. I was obsessed and I thought I was gonna be the next big thing at the Metropolitan Opera. That's what I was telling myself. And so my voice, it went in college, it just went away and, and they didn't know what the issue was, it was the flux. You know, so, but what that taught me though, is it taught me my idol. It taught me that music and fame and being this thing was my idol. Mm. And, and so it, it really humbled me to be able to see, I've got to really change my insides and uh, figure out what's going on, you know? So I don't know if that makes any sense, but, but acid reflux was a sort of the infirmity that helped, that helped me with that. Yeah. Donna, what about you? Thank you, Andre. Really great. Um, I love the sayings of your grandmother. I almost like she was like the original meme. Like she was putting stuff out there that was like landing, like the mic drops. Um, Donna, what experiences um, will have impacted you the most? It's so funny because I the first thing that popped in my head was my grandfather, but then I thought I I can't answer that, right? That's but then of course I can because Andre basically just did. <laughs> So it, it, it's my, he's no longer with us, but he still influences me because I remember, you know, he was, um, he was a trumpet player, but he, he never, he was in the army and he played in the army band, but he, he came over from Italy with like no money. He was very young. Um, and, uh, knew he, he would, he lived in the Lower East Side and, um, and knew how to, he learned how to work with a hammer. He became a carpenter because that's what you'd had to do. And, but then he would go play with like all of these, everybody, all these immigrants down there. It was like, uh, you know, everybody, everyone was coming to the United States and on the Lower East Side. And it was like this, they used to call it the melting pot. And he would go play um, and he would pick up his, this trumpet and he learned and he played in his, his, uh, but he knew, but he said, I'm never going to actually do this because I can't actually make a living at it. So he always said that, um, he didn't have a regret, but he, he had three children, my father being one of them, and all three became musicians and he supported them. And he said, if you practice, I will keep paying for your lessons, but you have to practice. You have to, and he encouraged them and he encouraged me as well. And he would say some things too, but his stuff wasn't as cool as your grandmother. He would say like, <laughs> don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. And I would say, I would say, grandpa, what do you mean half of what I see there? I'm not saying, he goes, well, someday you'll see stuff. And now I'm looking on YouTube sometimes like, he was right about that because there's deep fakes and things now. Um, and he also used to tell me, cause I was like, well, I, I don't think I'm gonna, if I don't, if I don't make it on 
but, you know, if I don't make it in a lead role by the time I'm 30, I'm quitting. And he said, you should quit now then. Because if you put a time limit on mm. on it, then. And I was like, hey, what do you mean? And I, so he definitely had that impact for sure. And now I have a five-year-old son and he definitely <laughs> is a big influence. Um, seeing a child, he, he loves music. Um, I, he loves his drums and his guitar and he just any any kind of instrument. And seeing the freedom. The way we were walking, he'll just jump up on a rock and then just, he said, this morning he said to me, mom, mommy, do you hear the rain? It sounds like a beat. So that, if that's not influence, I don't know what else is. So that's, that's it. It's my family. It comes from my family. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Let's go back to the chat and see if some of our Camp Carmen folks have a question. Perry, if you could read something out. Yeah, um, let's start with um, from Savannah. Has there ever been a point where you were like totally discouraged? And if so, how did you build back up from that? Mm. It doesn't have to be totally, it can be pretty discouraged. <laughs> you can let us sit there. I, I think, um, honestly, I mean, I know this is, everyone's probably talking about this, but this year, you know, I. It, and being on a national tour and getting shut down. I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I didn't want to tour, but I said, I'm going to do this tour for six months and I'm going to save this money and I'm going to buy a home and I'm going to do all these things. And it, I was on that tour five and a half weeks and then it was over for me. Um, and that was very discouraging, but there were other uh, discouraging uh, in the sense that I, I think I went through this thing where it was like, first it was just like money. Okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to, and then it was, I'm never going to perform again. Um, I found other purposes and passions that I didn't know I had. And so people talk about the silver lining, but for me, um, my, my, how did I, I, I gave, I just said, all right, I don't want to stop creating. And there are, is no show right now. People are asking me if I would teach them some things. So I just, I used to always teach on the side and then now I do it pretty much full time every day. Um, and I, I've found that I'm really good at it and I really love it. And now that performing is coming back, I keep saying, no, I, I don't actually want to go on that audition. <laughs> so I'm finding other passions. So um, I just gave, I don't know how else to explain it. Like I decided, you know what, I'm discouraged, but I'm just going to share in any way I can right now yeah. and figure that out. Whether for some people that's making TikToks, for me it was, all right, sure, I'll I'll coach you. I'll see how I do. And then it just kept going. And I was like, I love this. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Mm. Thank you. Andre, do you want to answer that one or do you want to move to another question? Uh, what was it? The, the chal challenges uh, or a challenge that was really discouraging. So um, about, so I, the reason, the main reason why I decided to join BMI, uh, the writing workshop is for my show, for Chasing the Wind. So I thought I'll do it for two years, I'll learn a lot, and then I'll apply all of that to the show. And so after two years, I did really, really well at BMI. And then I got an agent from it, which was great. And so then I decided to, you know, uh, present my music, present my show to to my colleagues, because that's what you do. On a weekly basis, you basically, all of your your work, you present it to your colleagues and they tell you, you know, what's good about it, what's not good about it, and they help you, you know, with your work. So for the, the two years that I was there, my work was pretty well received, you know, and I got a reputation for, you know, really great work. And and so I thought the song that I presented was called Can You Feel It? And I thought it's going to be the same, you know, that they'll love it and they'll think I'm great and they'll just tell me how it can get better. And finally, I'm getting to present Chasing the Wind. This is my whole purpose for doing it. And so I presented the song and it really didn't go well. Like they were very, very hard on it. Um, they basically, you know, told me that they were like, the singer is great, man. The guy, the guy, right, he's amazing. And you never want to hear that, you know, <laughs> where the singer is better than the work, you know, it's like, man, who's that guy? Let's hire him. You know, so it, it, it really crushed me. I just was not. I mean, honestly, guys, my response to that was like trauma. I know that may sound completely ridiculous, but I guess I just thought I have been working on this thing for so long and it's still not there. Writing a musical is one of the hardest things that you can do. People don't 
realize that. It's so insanely difficult. And so you think you got it and then you present it and then you don't got it because people don't get it. And that's basically what they said. They were like, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't understand the premise of the show. We don't understand, uh, you know, they had all these questions. And, and so it took me about three months to be able to pull it together uh, to, to keep going. I kept writing, but it was really, really difficult. But guys, they were right. That's the thing. That's the thing. They were right. You know, so when we have those times where people are telling us a truth that we don't want to hear, that we're not ready for, mm. we have to have an openness that says, well, maybe they are right. You know, I could have had, I could have said, well, no, this is my art, this is my work, and they're wrong, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And I went through that, but I really considered, are they right? And they were. And as a result of that, it has made the work so much better. So much better. I'm glad I listened to it, but it was hard. It was a hard lesson. Awesome. Snaps to that from Ananda. Yeah, some people. I am loving Alana's question, and I want to get to this question. But before we do, I actually would love for us to take a moment to to take a look at Chasing the Wind again. Um, the Kennedy Center performance. Can we take a look at that, Andre? Oh, sure. Yes. Okay. Frozen. <laughs> Okay, so this song that we're about to hear is It's Not Me, It's You. We did a performance at the Millennium Stage. We did like 20 songs at the Millennium Stage uh, of the show, and I got to sort of explain to people what it's like to write a musical. This was the early stages. This was a, a couple years ago, actually. Um, but I, I think it would be great for you guys to hear it only because the the, the female that you're, that you're gonna hear, Awa, uh, it's her voice that's going to be singing Stars in Other Skies, the song that you just heard. You heard me singing it, but if you can imagine her voice, you know. So uh, the song is called It's Not Me, It's You, and it's actually the second act of the show. So I know some of you guys were saying, oh, we're rooting for Abby and Solomon. Well, Solomon decides to have many, many other women, and 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 he sort of leads leaves her in the dust. And this is where she realizes, you know, there's another woman that he deeply falls in love with. And so this is when she realizes that, okay, it looks like uh, I'm actually, I'm not the one. It's not, th this love is not what I thought that it was. Heavily influenced by Hiram, Solom Solomon plunges into a dark existence. During this time, Bathsheba dies before he reconciles with her. As Abby watches him confide in Zahara, Pharaoh's daughter, his newest bride, she realizes her place. In his life. It's not me. It's not me. It's not me he loves. It's not me he sees. It's not me he runs to. It's you, I recall the day I made this brilliant, wise decision. I was small and unafraid, resilient, filled with vision. One day I would say, my prince, unlock my heart and do what you please here. Take the keys. I recall the time when I believed in princes, providence, and fate. I would fall, and all I had to do was call and wait. And he would take my hand. I was under his command. It was all planned. Yeah, well, I'm tired of pretending. I'm tired of defending. Come to your rescue, heal you from what you are. Oh, will she, will she, will she? No, it's not her who's untrue, 
Yes, 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 indeed. Woo, that is Awa, if you don't know. <laughs> She's unbelievable. Awa felt because it? because I'm just going to say this for uh, looking at it from a performance aspect. It's not uh, yes, vocals is I see vocals vocals but but do you do you see how in it she is everyone that the storytelling. Yes, the vocals are there but it comes from that pain, right? I'm sorry. I'm going into can teaching mode but tell, can yes. I tell a story about that? Can I say yeah. something about like that? Yeah. I met I well, about a year before this, I was doing, uh, she was doing the moon in Carolina or change. And I saw her and like you said, like you said, it was like, it was a glorious voice, but she was so honest, so real. It was, you know, she was the moon character, but she was this light. And so I came up to her afterwards and I said, I'm, I'm writing a show, please be in it. And she was like, oh my God, yes. And we've been great friends ever since. You know, so it's just a great example of when you do the work, when you do your work, when you are that person, you never know who's going to see you and who you're going to connect with. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. So what I would love to do, um, let's go with Alana's question and then let's take the spotlight off and just sort of open up on mute and have some conversation for these last few moments. Um, so Alana's question was, as your dreams and career developed and change, what grounds you? What is your motivation and how have you expressed that across the different mediums and different roles? So a few questions there. Yeah, can you read it again? Yeah, as your dreams and career develop and change, what grounds you? So let me start there. I know, I know for me, um, and this is something that's going to be hard for everyone here to relate to, but once I, once I had my son, everything changed for me. And it's not, oh, everything changed like, well, I'm a mom now and I'm not going to work. It's not that. It's that I saw the world differently. Um, uh, it, it, I don't know. I feel like m my acting became deeper in a sense because, uh, losing my grandfather and then my son being born seven, seven years apart on the same day, <laughs> by the way. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of just, um, has informed me in my life. I think that the... I don't know. That's what grounds me. I always, I used to, I think I used to sweat certain things more i would be so concerned uh, when i would go to an audition or or be doing a role about like what does this person think or that person and i don't know something and now i'm just like ah life is short and i'm i'm here to do what i have to do and um that and sort of my spirituality has has grounded me so that's i know I'm, it's not a very exciting answer but that's my truth so <laughs> Love it. It's the real oh, one. It's great Andre. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Yeah, I uh, I read every morning talking about spirituality. Like I read every morning this thing that I call "Embrace Your Power." Um, we don't have time to even talk about. I wish I could even share about what that means, but I will just say it's titled "Embrace Your Power," and I literally read this in the morning and I read it at night. And the first thing that it says is, "This is sort of my authentic my authenticity mantra." to honor and protect your sense of self. Honor and protect your sense of self. You know, so I read that and then I've come to realize what my values are. Um, spirituality, so my higher power, whom I call God, my God, being connected to that. Freedom, personal growth and development, 
creativity and art and excellence. Like those are my values. You know, I went through like a whole list of all the different things that are considered values and the thing that gets me going. When I say spirituality, I'm like, yes, I need Jesus. <laughs> Seriously, I need him. You know, God. You know, and so the second is is freedom. You know, just and freedom means that I get to be who I am. Please don't keep me from being who I am. So anything that's keeping me from being who I am, we're gonna have a fight. You know, and personal growth, development, creativity, and excellence. You know, so those things ground me when I know what my values are, and when I honor and protect my sense of self, then I can make decisions from there. Um, I can trust the decisions that I'm going to make. Thank you. Um, I am laughing because there's uh, one question from Genesis. Mr. Andre, so what time do the auditions start? I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> hilarious. Y'all are hilarious. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and take our friends off of mute. We can go back to gallery view so they can see everyone's lovely faces. Um, and... Let's open it up for some questions. If you put a question in the chat that was a while back and now that you've heard everything and you feel like it's really pertinent and you want to unmute and ask, um, go ahead and keep your hand up, Genesis, and then we'll go to Kobe. Just have a little combo. I wrote it down. My question to you is, okay. At what point in your life did you like come to the realization that you were truly good at what you do? Because I know me personally, my like my realization, it was like, I wanna say like a couple of months ago that I actually am good at what I'm trying to do. So I just wanna know that like for your personal like confidence, like your booster. Thank you, Genesis, great question. <laughs> Donna. Well, I always thought I was good at what I did until I started to get older and became a teenager and listened to the chatter around me and started to believe untruths. I, I I think if we go back to how we are as children, we just loved, we're just doing what we're doing. And then some, and somehow we let those voices creep in from the outside, or it could be even like a parent saying something like, well, that's good, but that's no, that's, you know, that's, you know, kind of crazy. I remember I, I wrote a song when I was eight years old and, uh, I won't say who, but there was a family member, a musician, and I said, oh, what do you think? And he goes, it's derivative. And I didn't even know what that word meant. So I look up derivative. Looking back, I'm like, that is horrible. <laughs> like he basically told an eight-year-old I couldn't write. But I carried that with me for a long time without realizing it. I looked it up going, oh, I copied? No, I didn't copy it. But okay, maybe it sounded like something else. So um, I when did I realize? Oh, my goodness. To be honest, um, I... I I used to look for outside sources to validate me being good at what I do. Oh, I got alpha I must be good at it. And then the doubt would come in again. So now I literally don't go, unless it's like my, from God or like something, I, I don't allow the outside. We lost your audio, uh, Donna. Donna, we still can't hear you. Can you hear us, Donna? <laughs> you look lovely. I'm sure it's really deep. The volume went away. That's terrible. I had okay. really good things to say, but can I you hear me like still? It. I thought so. Um. <laughs> it was really, it was really good, and I guess it's between me and my God now. But um, <laughs> no, I just said the minute you know, it's always a work in progress. There's always going to be self doubt, but I, you have to have that. It's kind of what Andre was saying before that, that sense of self, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Really, only five years ago do I think I really felt like I, I'm good at this. I, I really, I know what I'm doing. I'm good at this. Five years ago. Yeah. So you're you're way ahead, Genesis. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Genesis, we need to talk because you need to help me out. <laughs> I need some coaching from you, Genesis. Because I, 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 if I'm really honest, I still am working on that. Like, I was actually the kid who was talented but didn't want to sing. Like, I was the young kid, you know, me and my cousin Michael, 
like he wasn't as good of a singer and he was always trying to like sing, you know, with the family in front of the family. And they would say, Andre, sing, sing, sing. And I would be shy and I just didn't want to, you know, sing in front of people. And so they had to, you know, honestly force me to, you know, so, and I still in some ways am that little kid. I am still at 155, man, that I am now. I am, I am still like, I still have those insecurities. I still, and I think for me, that sort of perpetual feeling of unworthiness, I think it comes from comparison. Comparison kills. Mm. You know, and so it, it, it is always a fight to not look at someone else and long for their greatness. So I do have to fight even now as a, as a grown man to long for your greatness, Andre. And I say to you guys, long for your greatness, not someone else's. Long for your greatness, not someone else's. Because comparison kills. And then the way to um, combat comparison is honor your sense of self. Honor and protect your sense of self. So I'm not there yet. Genesis. We can talk. Help me out. <laughs> Thank so you. So good. So good. Thank you. I saw everybody writing that down. So smart. Y'all are so brilliant to do that. Kobe, what do you have for us, my friend? Kobe's like, I need to get that last little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing that down. That was really great. Um, and my question actually is for Andre. So, um, and this is from when you showed us the video of Awa, I think I'm pronouncing her name right, um, singing your song. Um, so like when you, like versus when you showed us your other song that you, that we heard um, and how it was kind of just like a demo version of it, how does that become um, this huge thing like that the um, band was like, because I know when creating a song, you kind of, I don't know, at least in a demo version, it's just like kind of a little bit going on. But like when you performed a performance, it was so much happening with like the band and all these different things and Awa's voice and what she brought to it, what the, in, the musicians brought to it. So how was that process like um, being collaborative with other creators? Oh my gosh, that process is fun. You know, musical theater is an incredibly collaborative process. It's one of the things that I love about the art form. And so it's why with COVID, it's been great to be able to, I've been reworking my show, but I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to be able to get other people listening to it. And then they add their bit to it. Like, oh, what do we do this? What do we do that? You know, so what you heard, and it's not me, it's you. Um, the orchestration was done by a guy named Dan Campolita. He won't, he won't continue to be my orchestrator. But back then, he orchestrated it. Meaning, when I sent him just the demo of me playing, you know, my little scratch track, and then he's like, oh, I hear violins here. Oh, I hear a cello here. And then he does his magic, and he makes it sound real good. And then I was awesome. And then she makes it sound real good. Even the best of the best have orchestrators. Sondheim, Into the Woods, uh, you know, the great Sondheim, Sweeney Todd, Sondheim, you know, even he has an orchestrator. And he's like the best of the best. Jonathan Tunick, you know, so even Sondheim will send to Jonathan Tunick just his, you know, piano and voice and probably has, I'm sure he's got plenty of ideas of what he wants. But then Jonathan Tunick says, oh, we're going to have horns here. We're going to have a, a Tim, Tiffany here. And, and he goes nuts. You know, so everyone has there, a role. There's a great YouTube video. Can you guys hear me? I just want to make mm -hmm. sure. Okay. There's a great YouTube video of um, Alex Lacamoire, who's the uh, orchestrator of Hamilton. And he shows the opening number and he shows what Lynn sent him. He let, plays it, which is just a, a melody. And then he shows how he built it. So if you ever want, he, it, I, you've got to just Google it. Alex Lacamoire on orchestration. It's a masterclass in orchestration and it's really fun. Um, I, I watched it and I, because I was curious. So now I'm taking you type, like in the chat so I can spell it right find that YouTube link free and put it in the chat for everyone, okay? Yeah, and we'll, we'll include it in the uh, daily call for tomorrow so everybody can take a look. Thank you, all these little gems. Ananda, um, and as we ask our questions, we're sort of rounding out the last uh, few. If you can keep your question as concise as possible so we can get just a few more in. 
I just wanted to ask, how did you stop comparing yourself to others? Mm. For anyone. For, yeah. I, I still sometimes do. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm human and it's part of it. But what I try to do is reframe it into being inspired. It's like, okay, I see that. And I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm not as good as that person, or I don't feel I'm as good. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, what am I, what am I, if I'm jealous of someone or something, it means I want it. If I look at someone and say, you know, I'm never going to be, I, I don't let myself say never, oh, I, I can't do that, or I, instead I say, well, maybe I'm inspired by that person. Wow, look what they did. That's cool. Well, maybe I could work on that in myself. That's what I try to do, because it's hard not to. I get it. But nobody is you. No one is you. There's only one you. So you can't try to be somebody else. Yeah. And one of the things that I love, and Andre, then you can take this, is how much both Donna and Andre are really validating the fact that that same work that we're doing here at Voices of Carmen, that self-awareness, that emotional intelligence, that being able to have the tools to be able to name how you're feeling. Is it jealousy? Is it insecurity? And then be able to um, transform that into something that's more beneficial for you in your headspace and in your person, that that work never stops, that we never quite arrive at being like, I've done it. I finally conquered all of my inner demons and I'm just like so whole and complete and satisfied. There is a level of I'm good. There is a level of contentment, but each of us will have things that we grow into and we're like, gosh, I'm glad I don't struggle with that anymore. But there's other things that you are wrestling like WWF to the day you die, right? And so this is where we become aware of what those things are and hopefully have the gloves, have, you know, the Vaseline or whatever we need to stay in that fight for the lifetime and do well with it. Andre, what were you going to share about that? So you guys do that kind of work too with at Voice of the Garmin? Yes. That is so good. Guys, oh my gosh. If I was your age, well, when I was your age and we did that kind of work, oh my gosh, I would be so different. You are so insanely blessed to have that. Okay. So I, I would say, in addition to what I've said, like the honor and protect your sense of self that like everything that Donna was saying, like it's so, that was so good that, you know, there is no one like me. There's no one like you. Um, also, I, what is it? The end of Hamilton? Has anyone here seen Hamilton? I'm sure you, has anyone actually seen it? So good. Okay. So at the end, what does Aaron Burr say? He says, you know, that there was room enough he just had known that there was room enough. Maybe you can tell me what the exact quote is. There was room enough for both of us, right? Is that how he says it? That there was room enough for both of us, you know? And what is it? The world is wide enough. Yes. And so that's the, that's the truth. And he had to find that out the hard way. You know, so if we can be able to learn now that there's room enough for that person that you're looking at, you're like, oh my gosh, look what they have. Look at their life. Oh my God, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. No. No, that you can be able to say, hey, they got what they got. They got their story and I got mine. There's room enough for both stories. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So I want to give, uh, I'm going to Francis. And while Francis is asking her question, um, Donna and Andre, as we get ready to head out, that was the one thing I would love for people to just be able to show you some of what we've been doing. So we have these very short sort of week one recap of our work and week two recap that we want to share with you so you can see what we've been up to in our process. And you can continue to follow our journey on Instagram or Facebook. We do have a virtual performance next Thursday um, and would love for you to come and check us out and see what we're doing. Thanks, Perry. I think we need sound. Oh, I am an artist through traditional art and music. When my emotion starts to heat, it's my art that cools it. Voices and choices. Voices speaking to our hearts, speaking to our minds. With words, they do affect people's actions. So if you're hearing a voice telling you to do one thing and you're, um, you have another voice that's telling you to do another, it depends on which one you're going to listen to. Which choice are you really going to take? Yes. 
one thing I do love as well, Genesis, is that you said right at the top, I have a different opinion than the two of them, right? And that's what we've talked about, making room for different perspectives, points of view. That was week one. Let's take a look at week two. This hand is my left hand, and without it, I'm not right. Micaela, a young woman from the country, arrives, looking for her sweetheart soldier, Don Jose. You step to a guy like me, who will always be really here for you. All right, give yourselves a round of applause. Another great work day. All right, all right, that's our crew, Francis. Um, so that's what we've been up to uh, every day. Francis, you wanna close us out with a final question? Uh-oh, no pressure, Francis. It's gotta be epic. <laughs> no um, pressure. So Andre, you had mentioned like loving opera. Um, so my question is kind of, I guess, two parts. Did you did you train classically? And if you did, was there like a, a transition, like a complicated or a hard transition between classical and musical theater? Mm. And Andre S. Jeff Y. I. Francis is a classically trained vocalist. <laughs> yes, Francis, yes. Okay, so what I heard because your video was going out, I have a bad connection, internet connection here. Um, can you can can you actually read it one more time? You said there were two mm -hmm. parts. Read it one more time. So, um, did you train classically, and if so, was there a hard transition between like classical being classically trained and like going to musical theater? Right. Okay. I did train classically, so I got uh, I finished my undergrad at CCM, got a master's there, and then did an artist diploma and opera there as well. You know, so I'm so grateful for my classical training. I'm a huge fan of classical training in in anything that you do. Like I said before, whether it's dance whether it's singing, it's super, super important. It really helps you no matter what you're gonna do. The transition that I made from the um, classical to theater, it it was, it was difficult. It wasn't difficult, but it, it's actually kind of funny because I had friends that would make fun of me. You know, so like when I, like when I first started singing Sondheim, like everybody says don't, everybody says don't, everybody. I was like, everybody says don't, everybody says don't. <laughs> Are like seriously dude seriously you know so i got schooling from my friends more so than actual school like my friends are like you don't want to do that you don't want to do that <laughs> help me out and then i just started i had a great foundation so then i just started listening to singers that i thought that are sort of like my voice you know like uh you know i started with older people like robert Coulet, and then i moved to like norm lewis and and um and john joe williams that helped me with a, a kind of a placement that helped to sort of streamline my voice and take the fatness out of it and the darkness out of it but still having that same support you know so it just it took me a little bit of time to make that transition but now i can do both and do both well so when you can do that that's a really good thing you can make that money and you can do it's not <laughs> so all right. So the last thing we want to know from Andre and Donna is sort of what's happening now and what's happening next for you. And that way we can support your work, your art, follow it and um, be your biggest fans. What's going on? Well, um, I'm teaching uh, through Broadway Unlimited, some private coaching, and then we have our online intensive coming up, which is pretty exciting. I got to sing the national anthem at the Mets game a couple weeks ago. That was exciting. That was amazing, actually, and super hard. I've sung at um, stadiums before, but you have a, a half second delay. So everyone should try to sing with a half second delay because when you, all of you guys are, you know, singing in a stadium someday, you get used to it. <laughs> and then the um, uh, 
July 26th to the 30th, I'll be up in Provincetown, uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts, singing. Uh, I'm doing solo shows there. So I have I have some cabaret shows and solo shows that I've sung for many years, and I'm very excited to be in front of a live audience and nervous, but I, I it'll be fun. So, yeah. Exactly, Hannah. Half second delay. <laughs> So, and that's what I'm up to. And then, um, and then I will be moving back to New Jersey. I've been living in Maine for 16 months during the pandemic. So that's, that's a big change. So that's it. It's been a pleasure also meeting all of you. And I can't wait to watch more of your streaming stuff and everything. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Andre, what's going on with you? What's next? Yeah, so, so for me, um, by the end of the summer and the fall, we will finish uh, demos of um, Chasing the Wind. So I'm getting an orchestrator that's going to actually orchestrate uh, three or three to four of the songs so that we can uh, submit the show to theaters and see what happens. So hopefully by uh, next year, whether it's, it's the winter, we'll do some kind of reading and then maybe the fall of next year, we'll be able to have a production of the show. You know, so I'm terrible at social media. I get stressed out by social media. It's just a lot. I used to be obsessed. And now I just, it's so much. It, I don't know how you guys do it. it I, it's so much or I'll spend too much time it's on. A full, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job if you're doing, I, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just can't do it, you know. So once, once the show starts uh, moving, then I'll totally get back to doing all the things. So you know, I'll tell CJ. will definitely know about that. So you yeah. guys. Will see CJ. And for all of those who are part of the Voices of Carmen family, um, each month uh, we send out opportunities or things to look out for. And especially if we've had guest artists come through and they're doing something, you'll see that in the monthly sort of Voices of Carmen e-blast that goes out to 2021, 2020, and 2019. At this point, we have 120 young people who hear about opportunities through that email monthly. But you'll have audition we- opportunities, which will be great. I also love that you have creative writing, CJ. I thought that was so amazing. Uh, the left hand, right? I love that. What that oh. gentleman said yeah. in the video. So. Yeah, we do written reflections every day, and every Thursday is a creative writing day. We have mindful mornings. We have workshop Wednesdays, and we want to thank both of you for being amazing guests on this workshop Wednesday. A round of applause for Andre and Donna. Thank you for being so vulnerable. Thank you for being so honest and genuine. Um, It's really what we're striving for. Uh, We're not like, you know, how do you make it here in jazz hands? Like, how do you be a whole person who stays sane and centered while having this amazing gift and art that you can share with the world? And I feel like you both really communicated that genuine in this and that working process throughout a lifetime of this craft in such a beautiful way and I know I'm going to take away so many things and hopefully I, I believe that all of our young people who are incredibly deep and insightful in and of themselves will also be taking away some wonderful things that they can put in their toolbox going forward so thank you again Donna and Andre and Lauren do you have a final slide for any of our folks who are watching on um our live stream to let them know how they can stay in touch subscribe to uh, voices of carmen youtube channel and uh, we'll be doing more carmen coaching series and workshops um each month throughout the year even beyond the summer but thank you all for coming Bye. thank you all <laughs>